Hey Megalithomaniacs, this is the new interview I've just done with Derek Olsen of Stargate Voyager, formerly Megalithic Marvels. And we get into all aspects of what's coming out of the ground in Southeast Turkey, based upon my new book, Gebekli Tepe and Karahan, Tepe the World's First Megaliths, which has been recently published. And you can join me and Derek actually next summer from the 30th of June to the 6th of July on an England tour we're doing around the megalithic south of ancient England. You can join us here. Uh, we're going to be visiting Stonehenge on a private access visit, tons of cool sites, Glastonbury, crop circles and everything else you can think of. So check that out at the link below. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoy it and do check out Derek's website and his tours, his events, his podcast and everything else. And make sure you subscribe to his YouTube channel as well. Again, the links are all here. Well, it's great to have Hugh Newman back with me. Hugh is a researcher, explorer, and now author extraordinaire. Hugh, thanks for joining me again. Thanks for having me on. Appreciate it. Yeah, man. You are. What I love about you is you're not just a researcher who writes articles and blogs, but man, you're constantly out there in the field exploring. I love seeing all your photos, videos on your YouTube channel, Megalithomania. And um, you've written how many books now? Oh, um, I've got like th- three or three or four, I've d- three I've done myself, I think. And I've done a few with, with, uh, uh, Jim Vieira as well. And also, uh, collaborated on a few kind of compendiums like Megalith Studies in Stone and yeah. Sense in the Earth with a whole bunch of other authors. So yeah, quite a few on the go. And we're kind of a third of the way through, um, another one now as well with that uh, I'm working on with JJ Ainsworth. Amazing. Yeah. I really wanted to get you back on here to talk about your latest book, Gobekli Tepe and Karahan Tepe, the world's first megalith. That's the complete title of the book. So, man, I was thinking about with all the recent discoveries at both of these sites, you could not have planned the release of your book any better. It's like it's like you had a, a prophecy or something. How did you time this like this? Yeah, no, it's interesting that. Yeah, no, it just, it just, well, the, the, the publisher always brings them out in like, um, uh, October every year. So we rush to get it in for publication and finish it, you know, by the end of May. Um, and, um, yeah, and then it just happened to be actually while we were in Turkey, I was there with Andrew Collins and JJ. And yeah, they, these discoveries were being made. We actually kind of were there when it was happening. We saw the new enclosure. They wouldn't let anyone see the statue. So we had to wait until they kind of publicly announced it. And, but luckily, our friend happened to be there the day they publicly announced it. And we got immediate, uh, we got all the photos and all the, all the footage and everything sent over to us. So yeah, it's, it's quite impressive. I mean, the, the discoveries being made there are astonishing. And we have to remember, you know, when it comes to these sites in Southeast Turkey, you know, these almost 12,000 year old sites, many of them, they are, um, this is the process of discovery happening right now. This is it, you know, so every few months, every year, at least, there's going to be announcements like this. There's going to be new statues, new enclosures, new revelations. It just, I don't think it's going to stop for quite a long time. So yes, yeah, privilege to be around at this time, to be out there and, uh, you know, to have this book coming out when it, when it's all happening. Most people in this space have known about Go- Beckley Tepe for a long time. Yet, like you said, it's just the, it's, we've barely scratched the surface of what's there. And so it seems like there's more discoveries coming out of Gobekli Tepe than anywhere else, even Egypt, Peru. And so that's what's so exciting. So I want to ask you about these. We'll get into detail about these recent discoveries, one which includes a very fascinating giant statue. But t- talk to us a little bit about your book. Um, tell us kind of, a, I know you've been going to Turkey for years now. You've been on the ground, but tell us kind of about your inspiration and your journey to writing this book. and what you think people would enjoy most about it well yeah the book um it's, it's kind of been in, in on the cards for a couple of years i've been working with my publisher john martino also with andrew collins and jj they've been assisting me at kind of getting it all together a brilliant artist called dan list this is the book itself uh 
it's not a huge book it's not massive or anything but it's beautifully illustrated by dan lish and myself we spend a lot of time making it look very nice you know it's kind of like the design of this series of books that come out um have been being published for many years but yeah obviously i've been visiting gebekli tepe um since 2013 so what 10 years now and also Karahan Tepe since 2014 before long before it was excavated so it's quite a treat to actually be able to get to these uh, sites before like all the roofs went over and the visitor center kind of gets built and things like this so yeah and um and honestly it's just the sheer age of them that really grabbed my attention because you know being a megalithomaniac I'm obsessed by anything ancient with big stones associated with it that's, that's my key kind of focus um you know the whole megalithomania conference and everything else so yeah to get be able to get out of there these early stages especially with Karahan Tepe I mean the site there is when I was there in 2014 even in 2018 when I was there like it's just like tops of tea pillars sticking out the ground like this much you know it's like what is going to be found here i mean what is going to be unearthed i mean we had no idea i mean we had an inkling of some of the ideas you know obviously there's going to be similar to quebec Lee Tepe, but you know, when you got that stuff like the pillar shrine or structure a b with all the kind of carved out of solid bedrock with these pillars carved out of bedrock stone head coming off the side it's just astonishing, you know, when you kind of think of the, the technology and just the innovation and artistic ideas to create such things. You know, going back nearly, what, 12,000 years? Well, officially, Karan Tepe is 11,400 years old, the earliest phase. Whereas Gebekli Tepe is 11,600 years old, the earliest phase of that. Although both potentially could have other layers that have yet to be excavated. So the dates are still in the process really of um you know proving exactly when they were built when i think of gobekli tepe or karahan tepe especially and for people who might be a little bit new to these sites karahan tepe is like the sister site of gobekli tepe which is how far away is that in mile miles or meters um from um from Channel Earth, uh, sorry, from Gebekli Tepe, it's probably like 23, 24 miles, something like that, sort of southeast of it. Um, and uh, yeah, so it's, it's, in, it's in these mountains called the Tek Tek Mountains. There's a few other sites in the area as well, like Sefir Tepe, Harbert Zuvan, um, Ketchley Tepe, which is actually just next to Karahan Tepe, and a couple of other sites that are kind of starting to be excavated. So it's, it's a genuine. Um, and it's a very unusual area. It's like a kind of Martian landscape. There's no trees. There's no water. There's nothing. You know, it's just like the odd farm here and there and just solid rock everywhere, limestone, plateaus and everything else. So, yeah, it's a pretty remarkable, unusual place to kind of drive through on your way to uh, this particular site. What are people going to come away with after they read this? Like, obviously, they're going to kind of know the, the in-depth history of these sites, the most, some of the greatest discoveries at these sites and and um is there a chapter in there that's your most favorite well yeah this this book is um is quite compact so we kind of put it into spreads if you like whereas there's like images to go with one theme like mini mini chapters and we get into quite a few different subjects obviously like you said we cover the the main history you know the kind of you know what people know already but we also get into the invisible sciences of these places like the archaeoacoustics the astronomy um, even the strange energies that have been recorded there scientifically. And also the fact that we, JJ and I discovered this winter solstice alignment at Karahan Tepe ourselves. Um, we, we placed that in it and we've, uh, with Andrew, we, especially his very into archaeo astronomy, we've kind of worked out a few more alignments since it's more has been uncovered. Even the new discoveries have alignments associated with the brand new ones, uh, which Andrew's uh, going to publish about in due course. And, so yeah so we cover all these different subjects i also get into more obscure kind of um out there subjects which i particularly enjoy um like the kind of geodetic relationship between other sites around the planet similarities you know with the designs and how they can be compared to other ancient cultures we also look at this is the working with jj on this mainly we look at the Luian type script, almost like some of the carvings, um, 
are very much like a kind of Hittite script from seven or 8,000 years later, mind you. Uh, but they're very similar. So there's a, there may be an influence even there as well. So and we go into like, you know, question of what it was really, what these sites were used for. Are they really just, um, are they temples? Are they community spaces? Are they dance arenas? Are they kind of theaters? Are they a mixture of everything? Are they even, some people claim they're homes that had roofs on them and things like this, which is kind of, kind of strange, but interesting. And we kind of, um, delve into that. We look at the, the construction techniques and how they were using advanced geometry and metrology, something I personally focused on a lot. And I've got a, a big article coming out about that in a couple of months. Where we've managed to work out they were using the same measurement systems as Egypt and Sumeria and Stonehenge and places like this, which is astonishing. And it proves that that's where it must have all come from. Uh, so this is all kind of new um, information. We put some of it in the book, whatever we could squeeze in, but we're going to, We've got a larger format uh, book I'm working on with JJ, which is going to go into much more detail. You mentioned the energies of these sites. Have you or JJ ever felt, you know, some energy coming out of any of these places at Karhan Tepe or Gobekli Tepe? Yeah, I think I think I, I I get like so kind of hyper and excited virtually every time I go there. I think it could just be because I'm going to these super ancient sites. But we know, <laughs> for instance. Um, uh, there has been uh, re- analysis done in Enclosure D at Quebecli Tepe, for instance, where they found, uh, this was d- done by uh, Paolo uh, Derbatolis of Tri- uh, Trieste University back in the mid-2000s. He wrote a paper on this. It's, it's all on academia.edu. People want to look at it. We mentioned it in the book as well. But he did some analysis on the acoustics, but he also had some magnetometer equipment as well and did some uh, a magnetometer survey of Enclosure D, specifically the, 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 the uh, enclosure, like the stone circle, really, he was working in. And between the two central pillars, now most, in case people don't know, most of the enclosures at Quebec Tepe have two central pillars. The ones in the enclosure, they're 18 feet tall and they're pretty much intact, actually. And they're almost balancing in these very shallow pits on top of these sort of large pedestals. The enclosure D itself is at least, what, 60 feet wide? So it's not a small space. And there's multiple of these spaces. But in the middle of enclosure D, he found these acoustic effects, which, uh, and the different uh, frequencies he found certainly proved to affect consciousness and things like this so it may have been a kind of sacred space but when he did, did the magnetometer tests he found something remarkable he found this spiraling magnetic field in the middle of enclosure d and like recorded it from every different angle he could and concluded that there was a magnetic anomaly there going on right in the center between these two pillars and this was you know pretty much natural and may have been uh, built around um, by the builders That's maybe why they even chose that site uh, to, to u- utilize that for some purpose. Now we know that, you know, different mag- magnetic fields and anomalies, negative and positive and everything else can affect consciousness. It can affect your brain chemistry and affect your glands and your brain and everything else, but also is known, and you know, this through the work of John Burke and Kaj Halberg in their book, Seed of Knowledge, Stone of Plenty. And other researchers like Philip Callahan and Alana Moore, who wrote Stone Age Farming, for instance, they know that this kind of not these kind of magnetic anomalies are associated with enhancing seeds and grains and the growth of food. And we also know now um, that this is the area where the first farming, the first agriculture, the first food cultivation took place. So is there a connection, you know, that has been overlooked um, by the archaeologists and everything else? So was there something quite magical and this subtle understanding of magnetism being known about at this very, very early time? And if so, where did that come from? I mean, where where did anything come? I mean, the, the style of the stonework, the sophistication, the magnitude, the the kind of genius level kind of building we're seeing here it, all of this just seems to appear out of nowhere although we do see, we do find a legacy of it that we can find little roots b- before that that have in the obvious influences which we certainly talk about but the, you know the fact is there is a genuine um energy there a magnetic energy and also one of the other things is that before it was excavated before gebekli tepe was um uncovered uh, there's a mulberry tree on top of the hill, and this is known as the wish tree. And this wish tree is uh, where people will go 
to, to give to make wishes especially to do with fertility because this for a long time this was known as gebekli tepe which means pot belly hill or navel hill like a pregnant belly and it really sticks out of the landscape it looks like it's just sticking out it's like quite tall compared to the other natural hills in the area and so women would go up there they would pray for fertility leave little ribbons and things like this on the mulberry tree which is still there people still go there and even there was different graves and everything buried there you know going up until a few hundred years ago but no one knew gobekli tepe was there so they knew something profound and it had this energy about it to be able to go up there and make these prayers and wishes for a healthy pregnancy and we know that certain types of magnetism in certain forms you know possibly from this magnetic anomaly there spiraling magnetic anomaly could actually enhance fertility this is this is the principle of what a lot of people have been writing about for quite a long time and so it all starts fitting together the myths stories the traditions um, and everything else even the development of agriculture you mentioned the discovery you guys made of the uh solstice alignment on the face i think that goes through the portal stone i still can't get over that face in the head discovered at karan tepe so massive and i think last time we talked you pointed out it's almost got like a serpentine features on the neck uh just an incredible place i want to ask you about this recent discovery at karan tepe of the seven foot six inch humanoid statue it's at least 11,000 years old. Um, I mean, when I saw this photo, I was like, whoa, okay, this is strange features, very, again, humanoid looking. And and then you realize this thing is not just life size, it's seven foot, six inch. Give me your uh, thoughts on when you first saw it and everything you've learned since yeah this is this is found in uh, the new enclosure up at the top of the hill hasn't got a name this enclosure yet but we, we spotted that in the mid-september obviously they found it by then but they kept it secret and in the enclosure itself there's giant t pillars like five meters tall or like probably um um 16 feet something like this that are broken fallen there's a whole stone going towards the north as well and pillars around the edge you can only, only some of it's been excavated but just to one side of these uh, of this whole stone and this kind of little altar below it which has a vulture statue as well as well as a, uh, a really remarkably polished stone plate which is many have been found now at the site but this statue is like what uh 2.3 meters or 7.6 feet 7 foot 6 inches and and it's kind of slightly seated. It's on like one of the benches you get around all these sites around the edge where the outer T pillars kind of sit between. It was found in three parts, broken. It's got ribs coming down the side, 12 on each side. It's got arms, sort of thin arms coming down the side with his hands touching, going towards its navel and its phallus, which is sticking out. You know, it's like, uh, you know, it's, it's a symbol we find, not just here. We find it at Say Birch. We find it at other part other sites in the area but the head is quite big but it's got this weird haircut on it as well it's almost like shaved above the ears it's almost like a mullet sort of brushed back going flat at the back it's pretty cool and uh and uh i might maybe we'll get it done like that and it's got a little square indent like a little raised square on its chest between the ribs and yeah it's, it's and it's got it's just humanoid it's very human and this is like the only the earliest human statue that was found anywhere on the planet was found in this area in Channel Earth at a site called uh, Yemen Hale, which is in the Baliklagol area. It's called the Baliklagol statue. Um, it's near the Pools of Abraham. It used to be a pre pottery Neolithic site there. And that was the oldest statue for a long time. And that was that takes to about maybe 800 years now younger than this one. This is older. So this is now the oldest human statue found anywhere on the planet. And it's seven and a half feet tall, which is like, hang on a sec, because Earth of Man or the Baliklagol statue statue was uh, five foot nine or nearly six feet tall. And so that was a life size. So we have to question, is this life size? Is it representing one of the builders of these sites? Andrew has been speculating and uh, discussing with me. He's convinced this could be an actual statue, a representation of an Anunnaki or a watcher of the biblical tradition, which is pretty astonishing in its own right, uh, because it really is quite detailed. It's, it's a little bit worn. It was broken in three places when it was found and kind of buried beneath the bench. But 
it's just astonishing that uh, stuff like this is still being discovered. Yeah, it's definitely astonishing because we're talking this thing's at least 11,000 years old, yet despite the massive weathering, the detail is still incredible. I mean, that's the conclusion I come to is that kind of it sounds like what Andrew Collins is telling you possibly is this depicting uh, one of the ancient hybrids, right? Whether it's some kind of Nephilim um, that we'd, we'd, we would read about in Genesis 6 4, um, because it's got that, like you said, strange head. It's not just some round, rounded head, it's a strange shaped head spindly arms very strange so and then when we when we put it in context with some of these other discoveries in the area um like the other humanoid depictions that you men- mentioned down at Saberch, um tell us about that one because that guy's also looks similar but then there's a a relief next to him with an entity with six fingers correct yeah, yeah. There's there's a ton of weird stuff uh, <laughs> being found in this area. So we have this one. You know, we have this statue from Karahan Tepe. We have must remember there's a statue in one of including enclosed A H at Karahan Tepe, which has eight fingers on each hand. You know, the head's missing, but it's, it's a it's a central T pillar representing eight fingers. Even Neshmi Karol, the head archaeologist, said none of the statues up until like a year ago had the correct amount of fingers. There was a lot of strange things going on with extra digits and things like this. At Saybirch, we have this beautiful panel. This is another Tastepola site. Um, Tastepola means Stonehill. It's the name of the project of this area. And that is remarkable. They've got this beautiful panel covered out of bedrock with this gentleman standing there, again, holding this phallus with a V-neck, much like this one, and Earth a man. Uh, next to it are two leopards, but just to his right, or when you're looking at it to the left, there's another guy who's like jumping, holding something in his hand. But on one hand, he's got more than five fingers. You know, he's got six, possibly seven fingers on it, which is very, very odd. And he's kind of almost being attacked by what looks like a bull or an auric, uh, which is very symbolic. It looks like what we find at uh, some of the later phase parts of Quebecli Tepe, but also what we see at Chattel Hoyak in hunting scenes and things like this. Um, so, yeah, there's a lot of different ideas about what this could all mean. But, yes, we are finding <laughs> representations of giant human beings, extra digits on hands and things like this. And even some of the statues from Karahan Tepe, which are in the Chandelofa Museum, so what appear to be elongated skulls. Now, these aren't actual elongated skulls. These are statues and uh, heads, and they go way, way back with a very intense look, very strange look on their face. So who are these people representing? Yeah, that's the big question. If we could go back into a time machine to 11,000 years ago, do you think, it was the entire population that might have been humanoid hybrids, or was it just the ruling class that was ruling over just more archaic humans? Yes, yeah, good question. That's, that's a tough one, actually, to, to, to get any answers on. I mean, very few skeletal remains have been found. That's the thing. Um, I mean, we did actually see um, some skeletal remains at Saberch in the new, enc- new, new excavation there. But, yes, yeah, really hard to tell. I mean, some of the depictions show very odd features, as we've, we've been talking about. The extra fingers, the elongated heads, extremely tall, very kind of powerful-looking individuals. And in my opinion, this is my hypothesis, my speculation here, that I think that there was a ruling class. You know, I think this is just natural i think they may have um they had these arts and sciences intact they were teachers i believe this was an innovation center possibly a type of university um and these were like also sacred places as well where there was ceremonies uh recording the movements of the sun moon and stars and also the carvings i believe a lot of them represent memories and teaching tools going back maybe thousands of years before these sites were constructed and there's also a fertility element here as well with all the symbolism we're finding and uh, especially with the new statue is a good example of that and so um it, i get a sense that this was a very classy very sophisticated group who seemed to develop maybe in the even in this area just through the influx of different people and, and different kind of genetics but also possibly through the ingestion of you know sacred medicines that may have been growing in the area which certainly could have happened here we know they were brewing beer 
We know that ergot is uh, produced uh, for the growth of beer. This was found at the Rakachek Cave in um, Israel, which goes back 13,000, 14,000 years. They found evidence of ergot there. Um, there's also these pillars in the pillar shrine or structure AB could be represent mushrooms as well. We know that they would domesticate cattle eventually with aurochs, bulls and cows and things like this. Psilocybin mushroom would grow on their dung and things like this. So, so this is like, this has all been talked about for a long time, even related to Chetel Hoyak. Um, so yeah, so they may have developed the right on them on their own, but possibly through genetic influences and also through uh, plant medicine influences. On Graham Hancock's recent um, visit with Joe Rogan, Graham had some great points. And one of them he made kind of near the beginning of the show was that, you know, for years, uh, Robert Schock were kind of ridiculed for their theories that the Sphinx could be, you know, 12,000 plus years old due to all the water erosion that they pointed out that surrounds the Sphinx and on the Sphinx in its enclosure, right? Archaeologists said for years, oh, that's impossible. There's there's no other megaliths this old. Um, but then Gobekli Tepe comes along. And as you point out in your books, and as we've talked about, it's it's forcing even mainstream to rewrite their history timelines, right? Um, so I guess my question is, oh, so so Graham's point was, if 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 the ancients could build Gobekli Tepe with these twenty ton massive T pillars and these amazing statues that we've just been talking about, certainly they could also uh, carve the Sphinx out of the limestone bedrock, right? Yeah, I, I, I have to agree. I mean, if they, yeah, certainly if they can um, create Karahan Tepe, which is a lot of it is carved out of the bedrock, and now they're finding say birches, some of the lower levels of Gobekli Tepe are. This is a huge undertaking. It's, you know, similar kind of stone. It's a limestone. Uh, the Sphinx is also limestone, I believe. And this is why the sort of weathering or water damage uh, over time is kind of is presented as it is. Um, the dating on it, yeah, I mean, various uh, people, including John Anthony West and then Robert Schock and others, have suggested it is super ancient. Even Bival, Robert Bival and Graham themselves said in the Keeper of Genesis that it's 10,500 BC because it aligns. That's when, during the cycle of um, the procession of the equinoxes and the obliquity of the ecliptic, that, that when the sun rises on the equinox, Leo would rise at that time. Which also happens at Karahan Tepe, funnily enough, and the head looks towards the east. So there's a, we've done a bit of research on that as well. We believe there could be something significant related even to ancient Egypt, because if they're right with the timing there, and there is evidence of certain sites in Egypt that go that far back in other parts of Egypt, then, um, it seems there must be a connection. It's something that, uh, various people have discussed and even Klaus Schmidt talked about this you know before we died a few years ago so i get a sense that they could if you if you can create the begley tepe and Karahan tepe you can carve a sphinx so i wanted to ask you about another site you were at recently back in turkey um that just amazed me and this was the i think you said it was a hundred meter long subterranean tunnel uh tell us about this because this thing was not just it's not just some hole carved in the bedrock it was shaped with like some precision edges in turkey tell us about this tunnel yeah this is something that we got tipped off about my, myself and andrew and jj when we were there last time we were investigating some of the unexcavated testabula sites um that haven't you know they're part of the testabula and one of the 12 sites but um haven't been excavated yet and we were looking around at a few of them just to sort of see what was going on see if we could find anything uh and they and we got to know we got chatting with the the local kind of mayor really of this village this guy who kind of this elder of the village and he brought out loads of artifacts um i said look yeah there's stuff going on here we found cut marks in the area but then we found um he said look there's a tunnel down there it's 100 meters long and it was 300 feet and at the end of it is a carving of a warrior we think now we haven't been in there for years um and you're welcome to come and have a look sometime so we were like whoa okay we'll we'll do that then so we actually got around to doing it on our last trip this we would talk we, we were there like a year ago and we heard about it but we've been at, not been able to investigate it since so yeah we went down 
you know, you got you got to remove your fear of like spiders and rats and things like this, and just just go down and hope for the best. And we did that. We went through this this kind of entrance, this covered over in bush. We got down there. It's pitch black. Uh, soot all over the walls. There's been fire in there a lot, and it slopes down at you know this angle all the way down. Um, and it's got a flat floor, but it's full of rubble now. Um, and these it's curved, you know, it's like 20 feet wide. But then every, say, 20, 30 feet, there's another kind of thing. It kind of gets th slightly thinner as you kind of go down to the end. And we couldn't get right down to the end because it's full of rubble. But we did see worked stones down there, like blocks. Um, and we have no idea what's going on here. There's no record of it in the village. There's no record of it in the archaeological circles. And it's a giant undertaking. This is a serious engineering project. And you can see the tool marks, you know, the ancient tool marks. And it's just, we have no idea who built it. It's right in the middle of this Gebekli Tepe sized site that's not been excavated yet. And we just don't know. We we know that there's a spring at this particular site in this area. So we know that that could be to do, it could be a well, but why would you create such a large, beautifully carved, so deep, you could just carve a small hole into the ground, send a bucket down on a bit of rope. And it's like, so it doesn't, it doesn't make any sense. It's a well. So it's also has alignments, which we're working on. Are we trying to work them out at the minute? And, um, now, if you're looking out from it, the sun would illuminate the whole thing at certain times of year, like it does Carahan Tepe through the whole stone, illuminating the stone head on the winter solstice. And so, yeah, we don't know. We don't know if it, it could have been built by the Romans for some reason, but why would they do it? Where does it lead? Does it does it continue? Does it then flatten out and continue across the landscape to other places? Is it a secret area where they kept treasure? What is it? We just don't know. So we're gonna. I mean, I'm, I'm gonna make a little video of our little exploration. Um, I posted some photos uh, previously, and so did Andrew. And we were just like, "What is going on here?" So we are gonna go back and have another look. We've been given permission. See what we come up with. See if we can get. We're gonna get proper hazmat suits on this time because. I ruined some of my favorite explorer clothes, um, just from the <laughs> soot everywhere, just completely covered in black soot. Um, there'd been obviously a lot of fire going on down there at some point. So, so yeah, so we, yeah, we've got, we're going to keep looking, but it, yeah, it's just an anomaly. It just, if that was anywhere else, that'd be a big deal, but it's completely ignored or the archaeologists don't know much about it. You know, we just, we don't, we don't know, but this is why I feel it's so important and, and um, such a, a timely thing to go and look, get out and look at these sites because um, this is all happening now. And, you know, stuff like that will be blocked off in the next few years once they start excavating. It'll all be blocked off. That reminds me of having just been in Peru. There was this site at uh, Oyante Tambo that we were at with a really great guide. He, he stopped us when we were at this uh, Hawaka, the Inca would call it, right, which they considered the sacred altar, but way predates them. And our, our guide literally said, hey, enjoy this, because I don't think that by this time next year, anybody will ever be even allowed in here. And he pointed out how they're they're remaking this you know modern wall that to block it off, just slowly but surely, right, systematically closing down all these these cool extra spots you can see. So Hugh, you were uh, just posted a photo recently of you and JJ and maybe some others at um, what is known by some as Noah's Ark. So I got a bunch of questions for you on this, but kind of just give us the backstory. Why were you at Noah's Ark and what were your thoughts? Yeah, this, this is uh, controversial to say the least, but this is um, a site in it's, it's near Mount Ararat, so it's near Van or Lake Van in in you know eastern Turkey, almost going towards Armenia. Really, we we were actually this was part of our tour we did, we did in September. We're doing this kind of eastern Turkey Garden of Eden kind of tour, and this is the biblical location of where Noah's Ark was supposed to have landed in the biblical tradition. This is it on the edges of Mount Ararat. This isn't actually on Mount Ararat itself. It's on the next bunch of mountains just next to it. And you can literally see Ararat just behind it. Um, and it looks like it's like, five, what is it? 500 uh, uh, cubits long, something like this. And that's the, you know, if you work it out, that's what it said in the Bible. Um, there's, there was a researcher uh, back in the seventies, did a whole thing about it. 
claimed it was Noah's Ark. Some people say it's uh, just what's left of a geological anomaly, which you get, you know, these strange shapes that look like kind of almonds or, you know, like this kind of shape, like a Vesica Pisces, the middle of a Vesica Pisces thing. And uh, but it's huge. And, you know, so, but it, it has, he's claimed this researcher, I forget his name 100%. Was, wasn't, it claimed, Ron, wasn't it Ron Wyatt? That's right. It was Ron Wyatt. Yes. Thank you for correcting me there. And he was um, there in the 70s and 80s doing a ton of research. He claims to have found wood, like rotted wood uh, or fossilized wood. He even claims to have found metal particles as well. And he found all this other evidence that the measurements, uh, the placement of it and everything else proving it was Noah's Ark. It even went through the government officials and they agreed it was Noah's Ark and did a big opening, created a visitor center there, which you can still visit with all the photos and everything that's up there. And, um, and they still, a lot of people still think it's really Noah's Ark, but we had a geologist with us and he was saying, no, he doesn't think so. It's a very unusual geology, which just happens to match the dimensions of Noah's Ark in the Bible. So there's still controversy about it. Some people still claim it is the remains, the remnants of, uh, you know, Noah's Ark. Others say no, it's geology, but uh, the jury's out, but we, we had to go there and have a look, you know, and so we, we, we luckily we got access to it. We climbed all over it. I got permission uh, to fly my drone up there because I've got some nice shots of it with Ararat in the back. And it really is compelling because it's like, firstly, you're in this biblical area, you know, it really is the Bible area. This is it. This is like Garden of Eden. This is where Noah's Ark landed, the floods receded and everything else. And so, you know, it, it kind of brings out this kind of magic uh, when you're there because you get this real sense of these biblical traditions. But at the same time, your scientific brain kicks in and you're kind of asking many, many hard questions trying to uh, get your head around it. But, yes, yeah, fascinating place. I mean, if you do go to Ararat or you do go to Varn, it's worth the effort to get up and have a look for yourself and make up your own mind. So they allow the public to go into this site and go up and touch this this formation? You can get near it, yeah. They, they they let you walk down. There's a visitor center up on a hill, and you walk down into this valley where it kind of is, and you can get close to it. You're not supposed to walk on it, but they don't really mind so much. Um, you just do it anyway, and um, it's fine. Um, but yeah, that's it. You can actually literally go and visit Noah's Ark. Simple as that. I kind of kept the kind of open mind and, and sort of was feeling the magic of the place a little bit because there was something going, something special about that whole area. Um, having never been there before. And there's also nearby, there's, um, some of these standing stones that are called the anchor stones. And these are found in the local villages. They're now used as gateposts somewhere in the middle of village squares. And these are quite large stones, I mean, a few feet tall, with holes carved through them. So people believe, Ron Wyatt, one of them, that these were the anchors of Noah's Ark. That's why they got the name, the anchor stones. But they're also, if you go back, these are also traditional Armenian gravestones. That's one of the other um, associations with them. You actually find similar things like that at the cycle Karahunj in nearby Armenia, which is a massive stone circle. Uh, complex with avenues coming off it over the border in Armenia. So, yeah, there's, there's debates about all the different aspects of this, but it's a fascinating, fascinating area. I'm glad you brought up the standing stones. Um, yeah, I did a deep dive on this a few years back, and I found those photos, and they clearly look like giant anchors, giant ancient anchors. Um, because your normal standing stones that we see in Europe that you're very familiar with, they don't have giant holes in the top like, you know, a massive rope or chain went through them, right? So they clearly look like massive ancient anchors. So you've got these anchor stones nearby. You've got the exact biblical location, right? Mount Ararat, which the Bible says is where the 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 ark uh, stopped once the floods receded. So you've got it in that right in that uh, area, and then I've seen research that said it probably slid down the hill, you know, uh, on glaciers over the eons of time. So you've got the location, you've got the exact length of the ark mentioned in the Bible, and then oh by the way, this thing looks like a ribbed boat. 
I'm not a geologist. I haven't seen it up close like you have. But to me, that's almost irrefutable that this could be the Noah's Ark. I don't want to say it is because I haven't been there. I'm not a geologist. But again, from what I've seen, um, from all those pieces of evidence, and then the fact that Ron Wyatt and others were given permission to pull core samples, they found like these giant, like you said, metal, not bolts, but metal rivets that seem to have been holding the wood together or something. So any other thoughts on that? And are you going to post a video, a drone video featuring this? Yeah, I'm definitely going to do a video. Yeah, I, I got. Yeah, I kind of um, when I was there, I did. I kind of recorded quite a bit of, uh, talking about it in the little museum they have there and at the site. And yeah, I'll be making a video for sure. Yeah, it's it's, it's a difficult one. I mean, it's like one of them places that. I mean, ha- half the guests were really really liked it when they were on our tour. Um, the other half were going, "Why are we here, Hugh?" really you know so there's like a you know a bit of a kind of split um when it comes to visiting sites where it's that controversial um but i've got to be honest with you if you if you're gonna it's worth going anyway because it's a beautiful area you get to see so much more in, in the general area. next time we're going to go and find the anchor stones actually have a look at them because even if they're just megaliths with holes carved in them like armenian gravestones are very very interesting nonetheless but yeah i mean it, i mean you look at the you look at the evidence. You look at all the data Ron Wyatt and others have put together s- since I think Ron Wyatt passed a few years ago, and it's compelling. You know, you have to admit it is a compelling story, and it just it is it's lots of little very unusual coincidences kind of linking up. Um, if it isn't Noah's Ark, so yeah, so it's, it's well worth checking out. And one more question on this: so, like again, if you see a drone's eye view or photograph of this. It definitely looks, you know, like the ribs of a of a, a boat. Up close, did you see anything protruding or anything that gave you a sense that this was just more than a natural formation? It's just the unusual shape of it. it just it, it, it didn't make sense because we hadn't seen, you know, driving there for like two or three hours from uh, Lake Vaughan. You know, it's quite away from there. Um, it's didn't see anything that looked like that in the area. I mean, I'm not a geologist. I don't know the area that well. We were, it was my first visit there. It was Andrew's first visit as well and JJ's. So we were kind of just going along with, like, oh, my God, you know, just documenting what we could. You just see in the kind of, you know, um, the skeleton, you know, what's the, what's left of the kind of – it looks like there's loads of mud and, like, uh, rock, you know, just formed into this shape, you know. But it's, it's still – it's just a very unusual sight, you know. So you guys recently just uh, finished your annual Origins Conference. Looked pretty awesome. This is a conference you do every year there in Wiltshire, I believe, right? And um, you've got a host of great speakers. So I saw a lot of the photos. Uh, I wanted to ask you about one. You had a post where you were with one of your keynote speakers. I think it was Irving Finkel. And you just alluded to his great talk that was about Sumerian ghosts. And so I just, without, without having been there to hear this, I had to, I want to ask you, just can you tell us, a, give us a, a brief recap of what that was about? Yeah, Irving Finkel, he's a curator of the Mesopotamian um, uh, area at the British Museum. You know, it's pretty, uh, he's just got back from Iraq, actually. He was doing some research out there on the new discoveries coming out of there in the, in the kind of, uh, some of the Assyrian sculptures and everything, but his um his talk this we we had him talking like way back in two thousand and fourteen. Funnily enough, his talk and his book was called "The Ark Before Noah." And he's because he's I'll, I'll come onto the Sumerian ghost in a moment, but then he was talking about Noah's Ark. But he found this uh, this this uh, tablet which he decoded and put it all together into this book and this talk. You know, way back. 2013 2014 and realized that the arc was described as being circular like round like a kind of floating kind of ufo almost and they even got to the they would actually go and make a replica of it based upon the dimensions given in this these tablets um go back you know three or four thousand years so yeah but that was then but now he's talking he's got this amazing book called the first ghosts most ancient of legacies and he's found and he's he's like one of the only people who can read 
um, these different scripts from this area, this, this the cuneiform, uh, different variations of it from Mesopotamia, from the Sumerians to the Syrians to the Babylonians and so forth. And he's found tons of stuff talking about ghosts, genuinely like people getting sick or migraines or illness. They blamed it on ghosts. There's even images of ghosts carved and lots of different ways to get rid of you know, techniques to get rid of ghosts out of your house, to move them on and other such things. And, and, and a huge amount of this was carved onto these um, cuneiform tablets. And he, he simply couldn't believe it. So he put it all into this amazing book and did this brilliant talk about it. And uh, I do recommend people check out Dr. Irvin Finkel and the book, The First Ghost. We're going to have it. We filmed the talk as well. So we will put it up online in the next few months because it, it just makes, it just suddenly dawned on me. My God. So if the Sumerians and the Syrians are talking about ghosts and how to get rid of them, how to deal with them, how to live with them, then is there a reality to this? And then we had Robert Temple speak as well about his new research on plasma. And he was, and, and it all kind of clicked because this is the kind of uh, intelligence behind plasma and everything is, you know, an ex an explanation for ghosts as well. So very, very strange um, connections being made at, at a conference this year. But yeah, yeah, I mean that his, his stuff on um, anything by Irving Finkel is, absolutely entertaining and quite brilliant to read i'll definitely be looking for you guys to post that uh, talk from him any other um great nuggets that came out of your conference that you want to tell us about yeah well we had we had a kind of there's a lot a lot of talk about carahan tepe and um Quebecly Tepe and all the sites in the Tas Tepela region. JJ Ainsworth's got some brand new uh, research, which is remarkable about the Golden Gate of the Ecliptic and how the symbolism found at Quebecly Tepe, specifically in Closure D, seems to fit with this. And this is a super ancient myth that goes way, way back, you know, 100,000 years or more potentially. So that kind of blew people's minds. Um, we had Deborah Cartwright, she spoke, she's uh, into shamanism, and she spoke about ancient shamanism and how this is can be applied to sites like a Beckley Tepe, and it's really hard to decode it from the sites, but it, the information can be gleaned from it if you know where to look. And so there's this real animistic, shamanic, even psychedelic element to these sites, which is uh, overlooked, which is something I'm fascinated by as well. Um, Andrew you know, regarding uh, Gebekli, uh, sorry, Karahan Tepe, the new discovery, and uh, this is the whole stone where the, the statue was found, the vulture statue as well, faces like north northeast, so it's twenty degrees off north. So this is precisely in line, uh, around just before nine thousand BC, with the dark rift in the Milky Way. So this is again, it verifies his research at Gebekli Tepe, looking at Cygnus and Deneb. Um, this is also aligned. Um, in the same manner it's quite remarkable the fact you've got a vulture statue there as well really does back that up because vulture is a representation of cygnus the swan or the vulture and so yeah so all this was coming out um we also had graham phillips talk on doggerland and the lost landmass around britain as well which goes back to almost at the time of gabelli tepe and uh yeah, so yeah, it was a pretty interesting conference actually. It was quite, I was quite blown away. I mean, I need to sit back and watch all the other all the, all the, uh, the talks again because I was kind of running it and uh, hosting it as well, so I couldn't really absorb the information. But yeah, I mean, we do this. We also do Megalithomania in early May, which is a bit of an extravaganza, and Glastonbury goes on for like six days in total. And um, so yeah, we like to get people together because real connections get made. You know, you get a chance to meet people and share ideas, and um, revelations often occur. Well, um, Hugh, as we close here, tell people how they can follow you best, how they can get your book, and all that good stuff. Yeah, sure. They can um, just go to megalithomania.co.uk or um, search for Hugh Newman. They'll find me. This is all over all over the place the book um it's uh in america i think you have to buy it through amazon.co.uk for some reason but it gets sent out from within america anyway so it's, it's the same um and it's published by wooden books you can check out the woodenbooks.com website and uh yeah obviously they if they just we've got a big youtube channel megalithomania uk um social media various various platforms and we just encourage people to kind of um 
you know, take a look and actually consider, you know, coming out to Turkey because this is very fascinating time to be going out there. We even go to Noah's Ark um, uh, every September on that on the Eastern Turkey tour. Great stuff. Well, Hugh, thank you so much for your time today. This is a great interview. Always enjoy talking to you and hearing the latest uh, news, and uh, we'll do this again in the near future. Thanks very much. I appreciate it. It's been uh, very, very interesting. <laughs>